I'd like to tackle something much harder. It's the question that is asked. You heard it in the first reading and as Luke records it in Acts. They're at this moment where Jesus is going to be taken up into heaven. And one of the disciples says, is this the time when you are going to restore the kingdom of Israel? It is an odd question. Now, maybe you're not, you're, you're not picking up on this. Let me see if I can give you a little background. In, in the time of Jesus and leading up to Jesus, there were a lot of opinions about what the Messiah was going to be. In other words, what the Messiah was going to do, how he was going to, you know, come on to the stage, so to speak. And, and one of the most common, not the only one, but one of the most common ways uh, th thinking was that the Messiah was going to be a new King David. If you remember your little bit of biblical history, King David was the high point of the nation of Israel. This was the moment when Israel was at its pinnacle of power and greatness. David, this great king, had the heart of God. And so the thought was, well, the Messiah is going to restore that. We're going to go back to this moment when, when everything was going our way. And we all believed, and it was just this great moment. But of course, part of that was that David was a warrior. The reason Israel managed a lot of what they were able to do is because David could take an army out and he could conquer anybody that was after them, so to speak. And so the, there, there was this underlying thing that, well, if the Messiah is going to restore us to this, to this place, he's going to have to be some sort of a leader, some sort of a warrior. He's going to have to use power, mainly in that day and age, to get rid of the Romans, because you remember that they were living under Roman occupation. And, and so, when, when this question comes up, is this the moment when you're going to restore the nation of Israel? That question is sort of coming out of that background. It's, it's saying to Jesus, hey, so is now, the, we believe you're the Messiah, but is now the moment when the King David thing all shows up and we get to throw the Romans out? It's an odd question. These guys have spent three years with Jesus, and Jesus has not given them even the slightest hint that he's interested in doing that. It goes all the way back, start with the temptations in the wilderness. You remember the very first thing, uh, the first temptation, devil comes to Jesus and says, hey, you're hungry, there are some stones there, why don't you change the stones into bread? Use your power in that way. And Jesus says, no, I'm, I'm not doing that. That is not the sort of power that I'm after. And you'll see it all the way through. Um, uh, what, they're, they're, uh, he feeds a bunch of people, feeds the 5,000. And in one of the Gospels, it says that right after that, the people wanted to make Jesus king. And he, he runs away, sneaks away. I know we're not doing that. He has that long discussion with Pilate. You know, where he says, my kingdom is not of this world. You know, he says to Pilate, you have all this earthly power. That's wonderful. I don't, I don't even want that. That's not what I'm into. And he's taught the disciples that rather than looking at anybody, including Rome, as an enemy, he's, you know, like that you hate, that you're supposed to love your enemy. He's been doing this for three years, and, and it would appear that this one disciple, at least, is sort of saying to Jesus, hey, you know, we've been doing this fun, nice, kind of play nice, you know, love your enemy, but is now the time we get to really get the Romans out of here? Which, again, strikes me as just odd. Like they just missed it. Like they just missed the whole message of Jesus, that he's not that kind of Messiah. He is a servant Messiah, a suffering servant Messiah. But as I was thinking about this, it's not that so much I want to just complain about a disciple, and, you know, being a little slow on the uptake. I think that this is in all of us. 
I think there is a tendency for us to, to look at Jesus and to realize the, the, the kingship that he's got, you know, that, that this idea that he wants, he wants to be this Messiah who is a servant, that we like it, but we don't actually get it either. That there's a part of us that wants to, like this disciple, was like, well, well, you know, so Jesus, when are you finally going to fix stuff for us? And when we say that, we mean, when are you going to finally fix things by force? A really good example of this, I don't know how much you would have ever run across this. If you listen to people talk about the second coming, the second coming of Jesus. You know, we believe Jesus is going to come back, but there's not a whole lot of detail in the Bible about, you know, kind of what that looks like and how that is going to play out. And so a lot of people, when they look at it and they think about it, they think about it in terms of earthly power. It's kind of like, well, what's going to happen is the world is going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And finally, God's going to say, enough of this, and he's going to send Jesus down who is going to fix it by force. You know, evil people get, ooh, you're gone. Good people, oh, yay for you. But it's force. And And it's interesting to me that Jesus comes the first time And he's not interested in it at all. He's interested in being a servant. And suddenly we're thinking like, okay, well, the second time Jesus comes, he's going to do it differently. It's like, what are we thinking? That Jesus, God's thinking, well, that first time, that didn't actually work out the way I hoped. And that, so I guess the only way to do this is it's got to be by force. I just think this is worth thinking about. Because even you and I in our daily lives, I mean, you know, like, I don't know, you, you read a story about a bully in school. And, and it's, it's, it's not our tendency, our first tendency to think that, well, somebody needs to beat up the bully. You know, like we need to take force to fix this problem. But is that really the best way to do it? I appreciate that sometimes those kind of situations, you know, um, and in other situations, sometimes it seems like that is the only option. And that's, I guess, why we do it. Maybe it's just part of our fallen nature. But I just think it's worth reminding ourselves that Jesus is not interested in this. So let me close with just, um, let me just raise something that I raised back in, I think it was November. I was just, I wasn't trying to be controversial, um, and you were gracious not to take it that way. I was just raising a, a possibility, uh, a question, if you will. And it applies to this as well. And I was wondering if I could just put it back in your mind for you to think about. I don't have this worked out in any way, but I've been really been thinking for the last couple of years about how the Christian church, that is Catholics, Protestants, the entire Christian community, how we have handled the topic of abortion over the last 50 years. And, and it seems to me we did two things. We did the servant thing for sure. You know, we started clinics and we, we did all sorts of things like the Columbiettes are doing. To this weekend, they're collecting stuff for two organizations that help women uh, in their pregnancies who wouldn't, perhaps would choose abortion because otherwise they can't manage the pregnancy. So we've done a lot of that, and that's a wonderful thing. And I think that's right out of Jesus's Be a Leader by Serving playbook. I mean, I, I don't know um, if it was, I doubt that there were people sitting down in a conference room, you know, plotting strategy for the next 50 years, but it was almost as if while we did this, all this really good stuff, there was some part of us that was thinking like, well, but that's not actually going to fix the problem. That's not going to change things. That's good, but that's not practical. And so what we did was we, we did the force thing. We, we went for, you know, like, okay, well, we've got to get, um, you know, certain people elected so that they can pass certain laws and not pass other laws, and we need to get, you know, judges appointed, and, and, and that's, that's, that's worldly force is what we chose to do. So we did sort of both things. And, and my question is, like, well, I know, I know Jesus is a big fan of the servant stuff. I just don't find anything where Jesus seems to be 
you know, a fan of this other approach. And so here's the part, and I don't know the answer to this. You, do, you can't know. It's one of the things about history. You can't go back 50 years and say, well, what if, and know exactly what would happen. But here's the question. If what if 50 years ago, we had not done anything about, you know, politics and all that stuff? Instead, what if we had taken all the money, all the resources, and that would be, of course, millions and millions and millions of dollars that have been spent over the last 50 years on political campaigns and March for Life and all that stuff. What if we had taken all of that money and put it into service? What would have happened? There's a part of me that thinks that, well, what that means is there would not have been a county a city, a neighborhood even, without some clinic, without some help to women who needed it. And perhaps, no, we would not have ended abortion. I don't know that we'll ever end abortion even by legal means, but we would have cut it down a great deal because there might not have been as much need for it. I don't know. I don't know, but I think it's worth us reminding ourselves that Jesus is not interested in force. And this disciple that asked this question, he's just, he just can't quite get his head around it. He's seen Jesus, he's seen everything that he's done over these three years, but yet he's still like, oh, now? Now is the time? You know, they never threw Rome out. They were eventually, the temple was destroyed. And that wasn't, that seems to be fine for, that was part of God's plan. And so, I just encourage you to think about it. We have this tendency, you and I as well, we have this tendency to think force. Jesus doesn't think that way. And of course, St. Paul tells us that we should think of it like, we should think like Jesus. And so, that's what I'm just encouraging us to do. Try in our imperfect way to think like Jesus.